Hello, everyone. Hello. Uh, hello. Hello. Hi. Uh, thank you all for coming tonight. And uh, before we start uh, with the seminar, uh, I would like my friend Martin to give you some. Just a quick announcement. Um, uh, thank you so much for inviting me to, uh, to give me this opportunity. Um, next year, the Latin American Conference of uh, 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 Students, the uh, Postgraduate Students of uh, Latin American Studies, is going to be here in Leeds. It's going to be uh, 26th and 27th of June, and the call for papers and also the call for uh, panels is open. It's going to be open until um, uh, March 2017. So please, if you have any idea of building a panel, of creating a panel of discussion, apply. It's free of charge, which is one of the most important, interesting things for us as students. The other one is, is, what, uh, is the biggest Latin American students conference in, on Latin American studies. So please uh, apply. Um, everybody's welcome to participate. And if you have any idea about contributing on, pla on panels, panel sessions, um, when we can discuss it and we can open one. Thank you. Thank you. And the site, just pilasconference.com. Pilas Conference. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and thanks for coming. We are here uh, at the University of Leeds for the second Café Brasil, an event organized by ABEC, the Brazilian Association for Postgraduate Students and Researchers in the UK. And today the topic for the debate is hate and intolerance in Brazil. And the event will take a slightly different format than usual, so as to open, the, open up the debate to more people. Uh, the main issue will be discussed by our main speaker, Leonardo Sakamoto, uh, who, who is a journalist, a blogger, and one of the leading voices in the human rights movement in Brazil. Uh, Bringing a greater depth of experience to the discussion, we have invited three speakers who will talk for around 10 minutes each uh, and who will lead the discussion and, and open it to all attendees and our online audience. Uh, the chairing session will be Dr. Silvana de Paula, who is a sociologist uh, and retired professor on the postgraduate program in social sciences and in development, agriculture, and society at the Rural Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. Uh, and our guests from Leeds University are Dr. Paul, Polly Widling, a Latin American specialist and lecturer in gender and international development, and Stephanie uh, Dennison, who is a professor in Brazilian studies. We will also have an online video guest who today is a feminist, journalist, and social media activist, Silvia Amelia de Araújo. And finally, in order to make this uh, event accessible to all, uh, it's being broadcast live and online with free access on YouTube. As I mentioned earlier, this is a new format for the event, and we hope that you all find it very enjoyable. Uh, however, if there are any technical problems, and we hope and there won't be, uh, we apologize and do our best to put them right. Uh, we are also open to your feedback on how we can make this event even better in the future, so please do, do let us know if you have any suggestions. As well as our ABEP UK members, I would like to thank all of my Brazilian colleagues who have volunteered at the time so that this event could <coughs> take place. Tiago, Arthur, Ana Carolina, Andresa, Gabriela, and Lydia. Thank you. So maybe Silvana, if you want to. Aren't we going to see the video first? Uh, well, due to the technical problems that we all <laughs> yeah, already got, and we apologize. So it's uh, uh, sorry. And, uh, and uh, Stephanie took the table also? Yeah, she took the table. And uh, yeah. how is the call with uh, Leonardo? 
uh, try to. Yeah, well, we've got thank it you. I would like to. So let's. See. We have to, uh, con you know, take some detour of uh, uh, in regard to the plans, uh, regarding the plans, because the technology is uh, it's a mystery. Uh, we can't control. Uh, hello, everybody. I would like to thank uh, Abeti and the organizers of this event for having for inviting me to chair this conversation. And also, I would like to to thank them for putting together this conversation about hatred and the subsequent behaviors, intolerance, and violence. As experience, hatred is not easy, nor simple. And as a subject, it's not easy or simple either. The more we read about it, the more we think about it, we find more and more complications. Nevertheless, hatred is an uh, essential material for us to think about uh, being, about the human, about being, about uh, being in the being, uh, the ontological um, perspective. Uh, it's also, uh, philosophy has been occupied with this since ever, right? It's also very important was the, when, uh, as a, as an essential mater, material for thinking the being in the world, the social, historical perspective in approaches the subject of, uh, of uh, hatred and violence. And um, probably since uh, last century, since that's modernity, let's say, um, also an essential matter to to think of the building of the self, and not to mention everyday life. So it's important, it's pertinent, it's necessary to think about, and it's difficult. And more interestingly, and more interesting yet is um, to discuss, to think about, and to talk about uh, hatred and the corresponding uh, behaviors, the subsequent behaviors in a, in a society as Brazil. Of course, Brazil is not a homogeneous society. No, there is <coughs> not such a thing as a society that is entirely monolithical. It's a very diverse society. But even considering this diversity, we have to agree, of all of us who have looked at Brazil or lived in Brazil or have looked at and think about uh, uh, Brazil. And we can we can say that Brazil is uh, amongst those societies where to think about hatred, to think about violence, and to think about these things as belonging to us is very complicated. We all know that the predominant worldview in Brazil regarding to uh, the, the very core of the ethos of uh, Brazilianness, so, you know, this idea that was built uh, in the 30s of last century, uh, the way that uh, the, 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 the predominant view that informs the way we look at history, our history, huh? it is a, a way of viewing things that deny the presence of, the, of hatred. Uh, of course, when we talk about hatred, we are talking about what? The other, right? And the difference. That is at stake. That is what is at stake when we talk about hatred. It's our relation to the, what is outside, uh, what is beyond some limit we define as this is us, or this is my group, or this is me, this is the self. Right? The, 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 the relation with the other, the other that is inviting and also the, uh, who is inviting and also threatening. Well, I, I, I would think of um, just uh, whilst the, the connection is ready, but just to finalize a little bit, 
Uh, I think that we Brazilians and we and those who look at Brazil can perceive that there uh, we have this idea our imaginary is like uh, hatred is the uh, the dark side of the moon and uh, there is this insistence I would say in not acknowledging that the dark side of the moon is just a question of the play between light and, and shadow. And in, in, in our imaginary, the dominant imaginary, the only one, in the dominant imaginary, we, um, there is this insistence that, is, that get, ne never gets tired in refusing that the other side of the moon, the dark side of the moon, is there. It exists. So, hatred is there, is with us. And this is not easy for anybody, but especially within the frame provided for the Brazilian um, mentality, since, mainly since the 30s. So, I thank you all for uh, the uh, 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 and the organizers for bringing this hot, pertinent theme uh, for, uh, to discussion, not discussion, conversation, for giving us the opportunity to uh, listen to each other with regard to this theme. Well, Isla. Let's start. Yeah, right. Is ready? Um, is Leonardo there? Uh, yes. Leonardo. Uh, oh, well, before we Leonardo start, I'm not going to, 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 to say anything else about him, except to say that exactly because of these technical things, we should uh, address our questions to Leonardo right after his presentation. Because if the conversation remains stable, he will be there and we'll be talking more along the, the even the conversation. And if it's if it drops, at least we have a bit of uh, exchange. But it's not <laughs> drop. Leonardo, <laughs> Leonardo, can you hear us? Yeah, it's, yes. Yeah. Hello. Are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. We are all ears, so you can start your presentation. Well, first of all, thank you for the invitation to talk with you all about uh, hate speech and tolerance in Brazil. Um, sorry about my voice. I'm with a terrible social and, um, and uh, coffee and so on. And uh, well, I was in Geneva last week and it was minus three, and now here in Sao Paulo is. 32 Celsius, and uh, this, of course, is not, well, not so good for my health. But um, uh, I'll try to, to be short and uh, bring some questions to, to you all. Well, <clears throat> I don't know, but, uh, I don't know uh, how many Brazilians we have uh, here in the room or uh, seen us now, but um, I. I'm a journalist in Brazil. I'm uh, I have a PhD in political science too. I'm professor of journalism in the Catholic University of São Paulo, and the well, I have a blog in one of the biggest news uh, websites in Brazil. It's called Universal Online, the big website. And uh, uh, in the last ten years, the blog has ten years old. In the last 10 years, I have been reading about um, human rights and politics in Brazil. And of course, that's when you write about your human rights. When you write about human rights in Brazil, you are uh, creating problems with a lot of people. Not just about powerful people, not just about people that um, dangers that, um, that make threats against uh, uh, human rights, but uh, among the ordinary people that uh, that uh, learn it along their own entire lives, that uh, uh, 
some minorities has no have no rights in comparison with the majority, for example. And uh, of course, that's along the last ten years. I took a lot of different enemies. I got a lot of different enemies. And I, I like to show what this means, showing two cases to when we're talking about uh, uh, this issue. I, I will try to share with you all uh, my, my screen. Um, let's try. Well, let's try to sh share the screen. Um, well, uh, uh, are you seeing? Yes. yes. Thank you. Uh, okay. <clears throat> I, I don't know if you can see, but this is very interesting. Uh, this is a newspaper in Brazil that uh, is a newspaper of a, a medium size that exists in Minas Gerais state. Um, and uh, I was suddenly, I was, uh, I was reading on the internet the comments about my, my posts, about my tests, and looking for the type daily uh, hate speech and daily hate and so on. But, and then I, I check out that uh, there were a lot of comments from elder people from the uh, retired people, uh, from grandmas, from grandpas, and a lot of a lot of them um, desiring desiring uh, desiring my death, um, saying that uh, someone need to kill me, need shoot me to death, and then I didn't understand why why that. Okay, every day I receive this kind of. Uh, of, of threats, of this kind of cursing, of kind of uh, um, bad names and so on. But uh, this is what is interesting because it was a, a, a specific part of the society, the older people that was uh, saying this kind of thing. And then I received from my from one friend, one friend, one journalist that speaks in in Gerais, um, a copy of this newspaper saying that the political scientists say that uh, retired people are useless for society. And then, to, to, to be sure that there is my picture there on the left, and a couple of uh, uh, old men and old women uh, walking to the horizon and say, okay, and, uh, and say, <coughs> I'm talking about, uh, that is me talking about this kind of thing. And inside the newspaper, one entire page, an interview, a big interview, question and answer, saying that uh, um, I'm, I defend that uh, old people must be recycled, uh, must be sent to trash. But there is a problem because I never gave an interview to this newspaper and I never said that. Never said that. But this uh, doesn't mean any, anything because in some hours uh, the hate networks and the internet was running, were running um, a lot of comments about this, showing that, well, look what Sakamoto said. And a lot of, uh, of these networks that uh, used to be used to by some hate groups in Brazil um, embraced this, 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 the, the, this history of the newspaper and start to share in the, the social networks. And uh, in some hours, I had uh, hundreds of thousands of sharings in the, in the social networks. And uh, I start to receive death threats. I start to receive serious death threats. And I, I, and I had to send this death threat to police. I, I, I went to police to, 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 to to make a, uh, uh, to register, to make a registration of this, uh, of these threats. And the people in the streets in the following days, um, a group of young guys tried to punch me on the street because say, you want to, to kill old people. And it was amazing because uh, I, 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 my lawyers, um, uh, um, 
got to got in the justice uh, the the right to 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 give to me a space of the newspaper to defend myself. And then in the following week, the, the newspaper publicized this one. Sakamoto didn't say that retired people uh, were used to the society. Well, this is almost used, useless too, but uh, uh, I can publicize, I can publish a, a text, a long text explaining that I never said that and I, I never gave an interview to that. And, uh, but uh, the, the, the truth is that um, this <clears throat> correction, I can say, this, this text talking about this, um, the wrong information uh, didn't viralize on the internet as the first one. The first one reached millions of people, and this one reached some thousands of people. A gossip, um, a bad information on the internet that carries a lot of uh, misunderstanding, the kind of information flows um, much faster and uh, go, going much longer uh, uh, that um, a regular information or a correction. This is that the second case that I'd like to show. Um, I was, I was. This is very interesting. <coughs> During the, the beginning of the last year, 2015. Uh, second I, uh, uh, hello. So, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, I believe you uh, you just shared the the regular program. I would ask you to please uh, share again your screen, and I'll uh, but now select the the open window, the full window presentation, because um I'm a, yeah, because yeah, we are just seeing the the PowerPoint software window. So oh. yeah, if you could, uh, you have to start the presentation, and then <coughs> uh, then you can uh, share again and or or you could also select to share the oh, yeah that that might work now yes right. sorry sorry to interrupt you but did you did uh, could you uh, uh -huh. see that uh, the we, two last frames we are yeah. only seeing the first your, uh, screen now we are seeing ourselves uh well yeah the, yeah. yeah because we just saw the this first, first one uh, the yeah first we didn't slide. see the second yeah there you go okay. yeah. is it the first one yeah. is the second one oh, yeah. Yeah. Are you seeing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is the third one. Uh, can you see? Yes. Yeah. All right. Okay. Now you must carry on. Sorry, sorry uh, to interrupt you. Um, last last year, the beginning of last year, um, I start to receive some threats and some uh, <clears throat> some strange uh, comments or strange mails um, saying that. Uh, I use it to receive one million dollars per year to defend the Workers' Party, the party of the former President Dilma uh, Rousseff and Lula. And I said, "Wow, I receive it. I receive that money. That money. That's my account. Account." And then I, I started trying to understand who was responsible for this gossip. But the gossip, the gossip, uh, flowed and flowed and flowed in running from the internet and uh, a lot of uh, very right extremely right wing um, bloggers start to use this information to say wow well, look this guy just write about human rights because uh, they receive money from the government and um, I, I i started to, I, I tried to to answer that and say well there is no there's, there's not uh, there's not true not true and the people start. Wow! If you are, if you, if you had, if you think that you, uh, there is the, there is need to answer this uh, accusation, it means that you are blaming a lot. And uh, it started flowing, flowing, flowing during three months, and I start to to receive death threats. Oh, you have stolen money from Brazilian uh, poor people, and you you will die. Uh, a person uh, spit on me on the street. Another person punched me on the street. I fell, I fell to the floor. Um, um, the Brazilian Federal Prosecutor Office, the, the General Attorney Office, 
started an investigation because to 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 explain why I received one million dollars to defend the, the Brazilian Workers Party, and then the the general attorney realized that there was a gossip and closed the investigation. And uh, at the same time, at the same time, um, I started to I started to, to to try to investigate who was the responsible for this gossip. And then I, a friend of mine said to me, "Well, put on the on the internet, put on the on, on Google your name, uh, make a search in the Google with your name." And then I made a search, and it appears what you are seeing, what are, you are seeing now on the screen. Uh, the first, the first uh, result: Leonardo Sakamoto Menti, Leonardo Sakamoto lies. It was a um, uh, bad ad on the Google, it's a Google ad. And uh, in other words, when you try to <clears throat> use my name or uh, in, uh, my name, my surname, the name of my blog uh, as a, as a, a search, uh, in, the, in the search, it appears that. Then uh, the, the website where I work, uh, where I work, try to put this on the investigation. And then it uh, took one year to, to investigate this. We we got the Brazilian justice system to, to probe some um, telephone accounts, um, and uh, we got information um, with the help from Folha de São Paulo, that's the major Brazilian newspaper, investigative reporters that publicized the story. We got the information that who was in this ad. And it was amazing because the responsible for paying this end was the JBS that the Brazil the, the room probably knows. That's the Brazilian, the, the world biggest uh, slaughterhouse, the world biggest beef industry. <clears throat> uh, it's a Brazilian company, and the company uh, was uh, several times accused to hyper exploitation of, uh, of workers. And at the same time, to buy and sell products with slave labor, and uh, this company was on the center of several uh, posts of, of my, my posts. And then uh, they, they, this this um, investigation of uh, that was publicized in their newspaper, for example, shows that a major international multinational Brazilian company was paying to try to create problems to a Brazilian journalist. Why I brought this is because I, it's, of course that if we, if we were talking, if we had more time, and if I had more voice, I can explain more about these two cases that are very interesting. But uh, <clears throat> the, the truth is that, um, let's look back to, 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 the, 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 to the conference. Um, Okay, I'm back. I'm here. But what the what what, what this what this, this means? I, I I collect several cases like that in the last years of the blog, and uh, I wrote a book that I launched uh, this year called "What I What I What I Learned Being Cursed Online," and um, this is a this is very interesting because. All of this case is showing that uh, the internet already changed and deeply changed the way as we um, consume news, consume information, um, uh, have exchange information with each other, and create the, uh, the symbolic elements that are structural in our society. It's, it's very interesting because uh, the underground of the internet, not the deep web, I'm saying, I'm saying the, the part of the internet where the news flow, but you don't know uh, the origin of this information, where this information was were born. Um, this underground, uh, where the information uh, flows uh, from the WhatsApp uh, uh, networks without source of information, without uh, confirmation, without uh, where the authority of the, the, the information 
is uh, given by the only own information or by the number of likes, of sharings, of retweets that uh, the information uh, received. This kind of uh, network are more powerful today, this kind of networks are more powerful today than the regular network network of information in Brazil. Um, it's interesting, by, but uh, of course that 98% uh, of the Brazilian population have access, has access to the television, and just 60% of the Brazilian population has access to the internet. But in the biggest uh, centers, the biggest uh, towns, the internet is almost universal, universal. You have universal access. And the opinion makers uh, are full access to the internet too. And even some liberal profession, liberal workers, uh, engineers, uh, physicians, journalists, and so on, uh, inform themselves more by the internet or by social networks than even by newspapers. And uh, during the elections uh, of 2014, the general elections in Brazil, uh, we had a very, very uh, strange case that in the day of the election, I believe in October 26, is the second second votation, second term, the votation. Um, uh, there was a gospel that, that was shared out, that was spread out by WhatsApp, that saying that one of the, the witness of, from the Lava Jato operations, a major corruption operation in Brazil, uh, that combat, to combat corruption in Brazil, was poisoned um, by the Workers' Party and by Dilma Rousseff, and was in the hospital uh, almost dying in Curitiba City. And it was interesting because this was this uh, this spread out so much, and uh, uh, this reached millions of people. And it was it was useless that the federal Brazilian federal police, the family of uh, this guy, came to the public and said, "Well, this guy is okay. He came to the hospital just to make uh, a, a check out uh, uh, to check their health." Because he has he has uh, heart problems, but the, everybody didn't didn't trust on the federal police, didn't trust on media, didn't but the, the, everybody trust on, on WhatsApp information. The the, the, the justification was very funny. They say, well, you might be, I I believe more in my own friend that sends information to me than in the newspapers or in the police. And in fact, it's not the best friend, the best friend forever that selling information that we will live or not. The fact is that people, uh, you, you, the, the people who trust the information, that uh, it's according their point of view, that confirm their point of view. And this is very complicated. This is very, very difficult to make a debate even today and uh, using the social network, as you know. Uh, the, for, the, for a good part of the, <clears throat> if you see, in 1789, that was uh, the great fear in, in the France, in the countryside of France, because a lot of peasants uh, uh, believe it, uh, in the gossips that flowed from the capital, that the revolutionaries were came to destroy all the crops and killing the peasants. This, this gossips uh, were, were, were spread out by uh, uh, people in the, noble people in France or in England, we, we never know, but uh, the people really believed that was, this was happening. This was the same thing that happened with when Warsaw Wells in uh, October 1938 wrote as a war of words by radio. Jersey and uh, uh, pretending that the, the, the earth uh, had, uh, was being invaded by uh, aliens and uh, people would believe it for that because the radio was a very reliable uh, uh, media as the same that where is a new media people didn't have enough time to be critical about this new media this about this new platform 
And it happens the same with the internet today. Uh, it's the same with the WhatsApp case that happens in Brazilian in Brazilian uh, uh, Brazilian general elections. At the same time, uh, to a, a great part of the, the, the readers, it's it not there is no difference between a big report, a big investigation that consumes months, hours of human work, and um, Fake news, a fake news, um, uh, uh, an image with information. If the this fake news or if this image of information uh, go and uh, help to to defend the point of view of the person, and this is, is very interesting. There is there are a lot of cases in Brazilian media today of deep investigations about social problems, about human rights violations. That were denied, strongly denied by an army of fake profiles in social networks as Twitter or Facebook, uh, that was operated by people that disagree of these reports, or some of a very conservative, ultra conservative uh, representatives, uh, congressmen and congresswomen. And uh, we know, of course, that uh, if the, the, the public debate was improved, if the public debate was better than really is, the situation uh, would be more difficult to have. Well, you know, you are in a table in a bar, a pub, and um, your friend, a friend starts to make jokes, misogyny jokes, uh, homophobic jokes. And uh, if you want someone on the table, if everybody at the table say, oh, then shut up, what kind of thing, what kind of hell thing that you're saying? This person will be very, very um, afraid to repeat this again in the next time. The problem is that in the social networks, this not happens. Or if the, it happens, it happens in a smaller uh, condition that happens in a, in a table, in a pub. If everybody in, a, in the social network in a debate, and there is a very interesting research from the from the University of Barcelona, uh, for, sorry, from institution research of University of Barcelona, I can give the name and the research later, that shows that when um, when appears uh, a comment, a hate comment in a post and uh, in a text over the internet, and someone uh, Answer this comment saying, Well, it's not true, and explain there's a prejudice, and explain there's a hate speech, and so on. The chance of the debate um, is, uh, going better is bigger than if no one say anything. Of course, that we say, the most part of us say, Well, I won't, I, I, I don't want to, to participate in a debate with a lot of hate speech. But the problem is, this is a snowball. If no one stopped the ball at the beginning, if you want to participate of social network and stop the, the, the ball at the beginning, the balls keep on going and going down the hill. And then it be uh, unstopped, unstoppable at the end. It would be impossible to stop. And uh, Bernard Charlot, the sociologist Bernard Charlot, saying that uh, a knowledge just uh, uh, has value and uh, uh, b uh, by the relationship that the, this knowledge uh, is, uh, makes in, uh, in, in the world. <clears throat> People need to understand that uh, it's necessary to improve the debates, necessary to improve dialogues, to avoid this kind of thing, to avoid to avoid being um, pretty precise, publicly precise, to avoid to be publicly uh, denied, <coughs> and so on. Uh, of course, that uh, we are talking about qualification of this public debate in a higher scale. We are not talking about um, you alone fighting against the world, but we are talking about institutions that are responsible 
to replicate the, 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 the big narratives of the society are being used there. Of course, that I don't believe much in family. I don't believe much in church, in religion, talking about the institutions. I don't believe uh, in the, in the, the workplace. But I believe so. I believe that uh, education is the best way. The schools are the best way for that. And in a second, in a second grade, uh, the media. Uh, we know that the media is the, at the same time can be the solution, but at the same time the per, is the perpetrator of several these problems. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> the media can the media on the trend of the on this transition to the internet now, the regular media, the traditional media. Then it's, um, I believe that uh, media can be used in, as a liar on this process, but definitely and absolutely, I believe that schools can be using on this. We need to, um, uh, to, to, to work with uh, media literacy since the beginning with the children. We need to, 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 to work with the children to, to, to to education of our human rights, for the difference, for empathy. It's very complicated in Brazil because um, in Brazil we have a very complicated uh, educational public system, system. And this public system, of course, that uh, uh, is used by the majority of the lower classes, the poor, and on the, the basic education. And the, the, the system improved the in college universities that is better than the, the private universities but then it's occupied by the rich people and the rich people the wealthier people but it's necessary to work with the space education to give tools to the people the, to the citizens to the, the the people to be able to identify fake news Identify what what kind of arguments it uh, has value uh, uh, has the, there is value arguments or not. Um, it's necessary to show to the people how to be a media, uh, how to spread out information. Because now we are not just we not just receive information, but we produce information and we spread out information. Through the social networks, and then it's, it's necessary to, to to work this to train this. We have some friends here in Brazil, as Rodrigo Rachier is a researcher in uh, education, that has some projects that uh, uh, train uh, students and teachers of uh, public schools to in the media literacy and check the results. And the results were were, uh, were very good. The the the, the students. Not just start to identify the kind of um, uh, information that can be um, uh, a problem to their lives or fake information, but uh, improve their, 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 um, their situation in other in other areas as mathematics or as language or science. And uh, it's important to that. At the same time, it's important to make to go deep on the education of human rights. That is a red is in, in the curriculum in Brazil. The problem is that uh, when we try to discuss um, homophobia in the Brazilian schools, uh, the ultra conservatives start to, to make campaigns and say that uh, uh, we are trying to teach. Uh, the students to be gay. Um, then we started to, uh, to, to say that it's, to, to try to, to include the discussion of gender, the, the, the gender rights, the gender issues on the schools in Brazil. And then uh, the ultra conservative started to say that we were trying to, um, um, to introduce a kind of a philosophy of gender that will uh, destroy the Brazilian tradition of family. And now, when we start to discuss the, the need to go in deeper and uh, 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 discuss human rights uh, and empathy with the students, they start to, one, uh, they start to promote one idea 
that is called a um, school without party in Brazil. That in fact is a school without opinion. That's uh, education without opinion. In other words, it's not education. Um, well, I, of course that we have I, I have a lot of things to, to say here, but uh, I would like to to, to open to to, to to hear my uh, my colleagues at the same time to hear your questions. And uh, but it's interesting because in the 1933, uh, a lot of cities in Germany, um, in a lot of cities of Germany, people went to streets and create and, and create mountains of books that were burned burn to ashes. And uh, <clears throat> because uh, the knowledge of these books um, create problems to the rising of the, of the group in the power of that uh, in the thirties in Germany. Of course, that we are not burning to ashes the books in Brazil, but uh, in some cases we are making something very close to that. We that, that in Brazil now there is some there are some kind of knowledge there are some opinions that uh, that were forbidden during the vote of this year and the last year against Juma Rousseff. If someone used red in a T-shirt or a dress in the streets. Uh, can and and uh, receive it, uh, different types of violence, including vi uh, physical violence. It's uh, I believe that uh, we we are now we are now in the internet in Brazil. Um, uh, the internet in Brazil now is a kind of teenager. We are right past the, the the moment of childhood where we are discovering different tools. And now we are using the internet without thinking about uh, responsibility or without thinking about authority or without thinking about the dignity of the others. I believe that we will um, run this phase and we will uh, finish this thing. We're going to reach an adult moment when we will use the internet to improve democracy, to improve politics, to, to improve the social relationships. But uh, until, until this, we need to work so much to, 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 to in these two ways, on the media training, in the, in the media literacy, sorry, and in the, in the education for human rights, to keep possible, we, have, we still have an account then. Thank you. Problems. I would uh, suggest that we don't ask the questions now. That we have uh, uh, the presentations uh, of uh, Stephanie and uh, yes. Tony, and then we make a, a conversation. Would you agree with that? Yes. Le okay. Yeah, the Good. Thank seems you. Yeah, yeah, it seems stable. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So, um, would you take this from the <laughs> well, well negotiated. Congratulations. So we have Stephanie uh, talking first. Is that correct? No, that's fine. That's fine. Yes, yeah, that was the result of no. We were, no, we were we were <laughs> <laughs> oh, we should so. give another go. Then. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes. Are you ready? One, two, three. You have to one, two. <laughs> <laughs> I'm quite happy to start. Yeah, okay. Okay, it's all right. Okay. Um, well, can I just um, uh, thank the organisers for the invitation to take part in this? And obviously, thank Leon Arnold for taking time out from his incredibly busy schedule to share his words of wisdom with us. And it's an incredible privilege actually to be here. Um, I'm very much representing the Brazilianist perspective, I guess, as a non Brazilian but someone who's committed um, to following what happens in Brazil and who is an incredibly passionate about Brazil as well. Um, I have a wonderful job in that I, um, I went to Brazil very early when I was um, 16 and I was an exchange student and I've managed to find a, a, a profession where I could just follow what I'm particularly interested in anyway. So it's that wonderful you know, sort of, uh, position to be in. Um, but my background is cultural studies so I'm coming, coming at this subject not as a social scientist per se or, or um, or as a, a political scientist, very much from the background of um, 
cultural history, if you like. So, and also as a Brazilianist, I guess, um, as someone who teaches at the University of Leeds, um, I have a group of students, I teach um, languages students, but area studies students, uh, many of whom spend a year abroad in Brazil as a compulsory part of their study. So I have uh, 12 students in my final year who have spent, who spent the previous year in Brazil. So it would have been July 2015 to July or August 2016. So an incredibly interesting time, obviously, for them to be in Brazil. Um, so part of what I have to say has got, got to do with their own reflections when they came back to Brazil, the kind of questions that they've been asking. Um, they're certainly much more engaged politically, I think, not just in Brazil, but, but, but in what's going on in the world than they've ever been before. So I have a group of students who actually know what's happening um, in, in, in the Portuguese speaking world, broadly speaking, but particularly in Brazil. Um, so they're certainly much more engaged and they want to know what's going on. But one of the things that they say is that they have incredible difficulty in navigating the spaces that are available to them to find out what's going on in Brazil because they are so used because they're, these are 21 year olds, 20, 21 year olds, they're so used to um, using social media and using the internet to find out what's going on in the world. And the difficulty that they're having is they don't know well, which news sources, so some people will tell me, oh, Folha de São Paulo used to be this, it no longer is. And this has all got to do with these very clear divisions, obviously, in political terms that we see in Brazil. Um, or what are, what are the social media spaces that I could be using, or the blogs that I should be reading? Obviously, I recommend Leonardo's blog to them. But then they get confused by the comments. Have we lost um, Leonardo? Do you want to get him back? Uh, he he some likes questions? to bring some water. Oh, uh, right. he, he's all right. So yes, yeah, so it's the, the comments that they kind of have difficulty with, and they're, they're always struck by just how much um, hatred is expressed and intolerance is expressed in the comments that are included in blogs, newspaper sites, they actually read the comments. They're used to seeing these kinds of um, um, gestures of outrage in uh, blogs and the newspapers that they read online here in the UK, but it's so much more extreme. Their understanding is it's so much more extreme than the Brazilian case. So they're trying to figure out why this is, and it doesn't match up with their experience of relating to Brazilians on a day-to-day -day basis in Brazil and living in Brazil. So they spend a year in Brazil and then probably don't pay too much attention to what's happening. You know, they, they, they rely on word of mouth to get their information. They come back and then they say, well, where do I get information from now other than you? And I suggest this. And they say, well, people are saying outrageous things. How can they say that? That wasn't my experience. So there seems to be this kind of mis mismatch, if you like, between the two. So that's, you know, sort of the, trying to figure out um, how to navigate and a safe way to navigate um, uh, is something that they, they, they struggle with. And I struggle with in terms of re recommending places that they can go to for reliable information. Um, but in terms of cultural studies, I actually think it's quite interesting. This isn't something I've done any research on, but perhaps others may be doing this in this, this research. The, 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 reading these as cultural expressions, these comments, because it feels very much to me because of this, um, also the repetition that you see, so depending on what side of the political divide you're on, very much as a set type of language. And simpl to simplify, you know, you've got words like petralha being used, you've got words like coxinha being used, so it's all reduced to malmarnas tetas do estado, all these kinds of terms, you know, these, this kind of repetition which I find really interesting. So it does become almost like a call and response, you know, like a hepenshi. So you've got someone saying something, and then the, 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 um, the, the very simplified kind of responses that you get. So it's a simplification that you see in a lot of pop popular culture, which has its place in popular culture um, for uh, emotional or a sensorial effect. So it's something perhaps we can think about. And I really liked what you said, um, Silvana, about this idea of the dark side of the moon. Um, because, I mean, if I think about popular culture, my research is on Brazilian film, Brazilian film culture. Uh, and when I think about this dark side, this is something that you can find in a lot of, particularly in a lot of early films and a lot of early um, popular representations, if you like. Um, and so if I think back to one of the very first, very successful Brazilian films, it's called Os Estranguladores. So the, strang the Stranglers, based on a true story. So an awful lot of these early depictions uh, in filmic terms were based on true stories. So it's the real gutter press, it's the tabloid press, it's those, you know, the, the more um, ridiculous, the more extreme the story, uh, the, the more likely people were to, to tap into it. So 
the expressions of, of, of hatred, if you like, of intelligence were part of they were part of you somehow consuming that and, and getting rid of it through your system. So it's this kind of idea of the dark side so that you can then focus on the positive. So it has a place, I think, broadly in, 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 uh, in cultural terms. So that's, some, that's one thing. Um, uh, and the other things that the, the students grapple with, just picking up, carrying on with this idea of this mismatch between their experiences of dealing with Brazilians and then how they write in social media terms very, very often. Um, very often students come, come away from Brazil with this notion of Brazilians as being, it's, it's back to uh, Sergio Buarque de Orlando's mm -hmm. idea, I think you were referring to this, yeah. weren't you, the um, homem cordial. But of course when Buarque de Orlando uh, um, uh, theorised the idea of the homem cordial, it was to argue that this is something superficial. So what you have is within, uh, you've got within this idea of friendship, there's also an opening for you to have extreme enmity. Uh, so that's sort of, you know, you, you have that ability, but it's somehow veiled. So again, there's a complete mismatch because social media and these opportunities to express this kind of image don't fit with that kind of gloss, that veneer of, poli of politeness, if you like, of cordiality. So again, these are interesting tensions, aren't they, that, that, that um, are perhaps worth exploring. Um, I don't want to go on too long, oh, so just... I have to, to control the time. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to watch. I do have a watch. Okay, go on. I'm, I'm okay. okay. Yes. But you have time. I still do have a little bit of time. Now yeah, you have about uh, eight minutes, five minutes. Five minutes, oh that's fine. Is that fine? Yeah, yeah that's absolutely fine. Yeah, okay. Um, and I said, um, when I was invited to um, take part, I said that uh, I could speak a little bit about um, the impact of these kinds of debates and this expression, these are very clear expressions of intolerance and hatred that we see, for example, in social media, the impact in terms of the international um, uh, uh, reputation that Brazil has, because this is something, again, that I do do some research on. My research is in and around soft power and the relationship between Brazilian film and soft power. So I, I kind of, you know, Brazil's reputation abroad, broadly, is something that does interest me. Um, and I'm thinking about the Olympics in particular, um, and one of the things that I was struck by, I, mean, I, I don't know too many people who actually sat up really late to watch the opening ceremony because it was on very late uh, in the UK because of the time difference, but I watched it from start to finish because I, I was writing a piece on it at the time. I mean, I, I find it incredible. I watched the Olympics the whole way through. I wish I had been there. I wasn't. It was fine. And then I watched the closing ceremony. And it wasn't the closings, I actually fell asleep in the closings, I mean, if I'm honest, it, it was late <laughs> and I had been very dedicated for two weeks. Uh, but there was the BBC um, and it was their closing bit before the closing ceremony and it was, it was dire, I don't know if anyone remembers, but they were deflated, the presenters were deflated and they asked each other, so you had different, you had Sir Steve Redgrave, you had all these you know, famous British Olympians sitting around the room and they were sitting there like, what was that? It was it was a very strange um, clima, a very strange atmosphere, kind of yeah. atmosphere. It was very weird. Um, and what they were reflecting on was what, what had annoyed them the most about the whole of the Olympics was the behaviour of the Brazilian supporters at the different events and the fact that they were booing. And they kept every one of them came back to the sort of the fact that it spoiled it for me that the, the, the audiences were booing. Um, so I suppose what, what I'm trying to, I'm getting back to this idea of the only cordial and this possibility of behaving in a different way. Because again, Wacky Joel Landon does argue this, that, you know, the Brazilian students should soon. Two minutes. Two minutes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Wrapping Sorry. up. I'm wrapping up. up. <coughs> All right, that's fine. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that's okay. Um, so the, the argument is that uh, you, you shouldn't necessarily have to feel that you have to conform to a particular way of behaviour. So this was this was one of the great things that Wacky Joel Landon was able to, to argue back in the 1930s. And so the British, the British uh, spectators simply couldn't understand why Brazilians weren't being nice. Yeah, the, why they weren't being polite. Why aren't they being friendly? Isn't that what Brazilians are? So this is kind of again uh, interesting to think about this in this particular kind of um, context. Um, I'm gonna. The one final thing. This is about two minutes. I think. Uh, one of the final things that I just wanted to comment on was just where do we send students um, and what are the possibilities in terms of, since so many people are getting their information from social media, from blogs, etc. What, 
what are the possibilities for actually encouraging people to think carefully about what they're reading, where they get their information from, um, and making them more visually literate. And I think, if I'm, I'm right, I think I'm right in saying that the most popular blogs in Brazil at the moment are and satirical blogs, but with young people. So these are all blogs, I saw the list, I haven't heard of any of them, if I'm honest, but really young people, so teenagers, young adults are all looking at satirical blogs. A lot of them appear to be apolitical, but one or two of them are prepared to send people up. Um, so if I could just finish by tying this back to where I come from, which is Northern Ireland. So I'm from somewhere. I was brought up in a climate in the 1970s of extreme intolerance and hatred in a very divided society. And if I look now and think, how have we got to the point where we're at, where things are starting, definitely starting to improve and starting to settle down. One of the great examples for me of how things have moved on is that we have wonderful satirical sites where uh, people of the loyalist um, persuasion or the tradition can actually poke fun at themselves through these satirical sites. So young uh, Protestant men are able to look at their paramilitary leaders or their politicians, their evangelical homophobic politicians, and have them set up and realise through this use of satire and humour online um, that there's something probably wrong with their own mindset. Yeah, I'll leave it. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to start with a thanks and an apology. So thanks for inviting me, and, and you know it, it's been great to hear Leonardo talk. Great to hear Stephanie's intervention, um, and an apology because I'm not going to be able to look. So I've got a load of random thoughts, and I'm not quite sure where it's going to go. Yeah, no, that was that was good. So I think I'm um, I'm going to shift the focus slightly, and that's partly because of where I'm coming from. I'm thinking about the speech to the actual acts of hatred. So although you know Leonardo's talk did blur or blur move between the two and certainly talk about actual acts of violence and you know sort of concrete um, experiences of hatred. When I was thinking about this, I was thinking much more in terms of hate crime, and particularly because my um, background is violence and I study gender and violence and thinking about which acts of violence get acknowledged, which ones get you know media responses, who talks about what kind of acts and how they talk about those things differently. Um, and when Silvana was talking, I was actually thinking that a lot of what you were saying about hatred, you can actually apply to the study of violence. So, you know, thinking about othering it, seeing it as somewhere else, seeing it as something, you know, the dark side of the mood, somewhere else, denying that it happens. It's not my friends that do this. You know, it's, some, it's somewhere else. That's often what happens when you talk about violence as well. It's something that somebody else does elsewhere. It's not people I know that are good people that do this um, kind of thing. And it's also about spreading a message. And I think hate, crime or hate acts or hate speech is about spreading a message. It's about intimidating other groups, about othering other groups, but also sending a message about hierarchies, about superiorities, um, you know, and, and about saying there are differences there and that some, some groups are somehow worthy and some groups are, um, are not worthy. But when I was thinking about this idea of hate crime, because I think, I think you actually put that in the email, which is what sent me off in that tangent, and obviously because of what I research but maybe i maybe i misread it because i interpreted that as um, crime not just uh not just speech which obviously the two things can um overlap um but i was thinking about well where does this term come from why do we use it why do we talk about it in this way and as far as my understanding goes it comes from america and um, certainly in terms of hate crime and comes out of activism so it's about trying to identify people who are spreading those messages that we don't agree with. So there's a <coughs> morality in it about saying there are groups there who are saying something that, or doing something that we don't agree with. Um, whereas other acts that might be comparable won't necessarily get classed on that, under that label because it's not, you know, they share an ideology um, with you. And so when Leonardo was talking about hate networks on the internet. I was thinking that about that as well. It's like, how do we classify something that isn't purely based on our ideology and just saying, well, they're wrong, so yeah. therefore yeah. we're going to give them this negative um, label. So I think how we define those sorts of those groups, those, those flows of information and so on, is is, um, is really important. And then I think the other thing that's important, which also touches on what you were just saying, Steph, about <coughs> Northern Ireland and thinking about you know, I think there's a real perception in the media, in you know, internationally, including in Brazil, 
that the, these things are on the rise, that there's something that's happening at the moment that society in Brazil and, you know, we're going to have to look at UK and the US at the moment to say there are these deep divisions. And this kind of crime, this kind of othering and, and so on is, is on, the, on the rise. And I think it's very, very difficult. I mean, I always tell all my students who do anything to advise you, measuring is just so difficult because how do you report it? How do you recognize an incident of, you know, an incident of hate speech? You know, where are the boundaries on that? And just because it's recognized and recorded and, and perhaps actually gone as far as making a report doesn't mean that there aren't 10 other acts that aren't recorded. So then saying it's on the up can equally be about an increase in awareness of it. It can be a, a, a label that we're now attaching to it. So if it is a, a hate crime or an act of hate speech or that we have a label for it that perhaps we didn't have before, so that makes it visible. But what I think is really interesting there is what becomes visible and what doesn't. And certainly when I was looking at various blogs, among other things, and, and news articles in the last few days, thinking about this um, talk, that, um, that hate, when, when the term hate crime is used, certainly, it is referring much more to race and sometimes religion. And that, you know, I'm talking and looking at Brazil, Brazilian um, context, not more generally, but it, it also goes um, to a similar extent to the, to the US and the UK. Whereas, of course, because what I look at is gender, and a lot of things that do, um, you know, are clearly violent acts, they're criminal acts, they're, you know, ag ag aggressive, they're, they're, you know, they're all about this sort of discrimination, but they're not necessarily classed as the same category, and therefore often not about the same seriousness um, as that. So I know actually Leonardo's written on this because I found it when I was looking, but um, I've actually started writing about the a gang rape case of the 16 year old in May um, and the use of media around that and, and very much what you're talking about, the kind of comments. I mean, I, I can only read so far when you read something that is, you know, uh, supportive of that girl and her actions and the comments and the reactions, but also the actual article that deny, you know, her victimhood then say that she was culpable because of what she did. And to me, that there, there are, you know, clear misogynistic, you know, um, discourses there that are about hate, it's about hating women, um, but they're not identified readily as that. Um, and so the final point I just wanted to raise then is also about how that, that sort of counter language and the way of silencing. And I think when Leonardo said uh, uh, the example of being in the pub and that people might actually shout somebody down or, or might, you know, um, mm -hmm say that what they're saying is not right and that acts as some kind of social control. I'm not so sure and I don't I don't know if it sits well with what you were saying Leonardo at the end about saying you know that the, the internet is a useful thing and we're not really used to communicating on it and we haven't got those kind of social controls which is you know I think a very valid argument but that I think it's almost it's this hyper discussion you know the ritualization of it but this you know it's like these very short, um, you know, sometimes you know, re repeated, but these 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 short, angry responses to people. People don't listen to each other. Mm -hmm. They're going in there, and it, it's you know, it's very very aggressive, very very confrontational. But they use things, you know, use these tropes to silence, you know, very legitimate problems. I'm almost there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. Yeah, I mean that was that was the last point about the sort of you know the dismissing of those those points and you know whether that's saying that people are going oh well, you know for me 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 or whether they're saying about um, you know it, one of the comments I read was well these feminists they're not fighting for equality because if they were fighting for equality we'd be there by now it's because they're fighting for themselves you know it's their own interest that they're looking after so there are, there's, you know or people who write about gender and gender and violence it's all you know it's about man hating you know and then you get the counter i mean I'm, that's that's trying to go on a tandem but you get the counter where people actually then try and be very conciliatory because they don't want to arouse that opinion around that arouse that response which goes back finally finally to that point in the pub i think a lot of people are because of that confrontational nature particularly on the internet and particularly on social media are very reluctant to engage because they know it brings on that back. So I'm not saying it's right that people don't, but I completely understand 
why people don't, or why people are very reluctant to sort of put themselves in there and to open themselves up to the kind of views that Leonardo has discussed. We have, we, Leonardo is still there, we, we have a video to watch too, yes. and um, uh, just, uh, I think that just to pinpoint some things that have been uh, discussed, so there is the voice in here. I, I, I would like to pinpoint uh, this idea of uh, uh, destroying the other, the other, and the destruction of the other, the noise. I, like, I would like to include in this conversation a very, uh, an idea that is very dear to Mauro Gias, to the Oeta psychosis and Oeta uh, terrorism, which is the idea of vociferation in, in Portuguese, you know all the proverbs. Uh, so it's matar cachorra grito, when you silence the other by speaking louder and silent destruction of the other being the other religiously defined gender defined whatever defined. and that thing that uh, in 36 the cordiality that is it's, it's not to be nice but it's to be moved by the heart cardio that was what uh, uh Black, uh, this is interesting to highlight she mentioned it it has to do with passion, with the pathos. So it can be nice and it can be hatred. It's emotional, it's passion, it's not nice. But the Brazilian imaginary confronts it with, you know, we are nice, we like football and so on, right? Okay, ready for the video. I was making, uh, doing this three right. points just to, to give a time for the, for, for setting the video. e lugares, sou professora durante um tempo na Universidade Federal de Minas Gerais, curso de comunicação social. O que eu acho importante na minha apresentação para esse debate, especificamente, é contar que eu ingressei como aluna da UFMG é, no ano 2000, antes da, do início da política de, de cotas raciais e sociais. É, eu fui uma das poucas exceções de alunos de escolas públicas, estaduais, alunos pobres, é, no curso de elite, uma faculdade de prestígio no Brasil. É, ainda não, não era a época das redes sociais, é, mas na universidade eu comecei a participar de debates e a ter contato com pessoas com diferentes, com diferentes opiniões, muito diferentes das minhas, e comecei a viver conflitos relacionados a essas diferenças. Né? É, para os meus colegas, para muitos deles, era muito difícil me compreender, para mim era muito difícil compreender o que eu fazia. Eu lembro de uma história assim específica, para exemplificar. A gente tinha um grupo de e-mails, né? É, a gente mandava uma mensagem para todos os colegas. E sempre eles comentavam assim: Ah, não vamos em tal bar, em tal, tal barzinho assim, para ele dar muita gente bonita. Ou, ah, não, tal boate eu não vou, porque ele dá muita gente feia. É, né? tal lugar é tem gente bonita, tal lugar é tem gente feia. É uma vez eu escrevi um e-mail para todos, assim, falando do tanto de preconceito social que eu via nessa, nessa expressão que eles usavam. Quando eles diziam que a gente fez gente bonita, indiretamente eles estavam querendo dizer gente rica, gente branca. É, claro, eles não gostaram disso, tem vários debates sobre esses outros assuntos. É, foi muito importante para mim essa experiência na universidade. Para aprender a não generalizar, a 
também a, a, a debater, assim, é, exaltar sempre a democracia, todas as vezes, mas eu, eu aprendi a debater, eles também evoluíram, é, porém, depois de formar, já como jornalista, é, eu começo a usar as redes sociais e como eu percebi. Eu acho que a forma como eu uso o Facebook é o motivo que eu preciso convidada para esse debate. Eu faço um esforço de não viver dentro de uma bolha de pessoas da mesma opinião. É, muitos dos meus amigos me criticam por isso, assim, eu falo que você tem coragem de aceitar uma amizade virtual com uma pessoa que tem opiniões absurdas. E todo mundo, faça com que eu conheço, muito orgulho de é, excluir todas as pessoas que pensam diferente da sua rede e de viver dentro de é, mundo calmo e de ser grandes conflitos. Eu dou muito minha opinião, não tenho muitos amigos que eu não conheço e só delevo as pessoas que me ameaçam ou, ou me interessam de uma forma é, mais extrema. Assim. Mas eu não tenho não. Mesmo um pouquinho mais assim, que eu sou realmente contrária. É, então, como eu, eu tenho essa relação mais aberta com as redes sociais, eu falo que algumas coisas que eu escrevo que eu tenho E aí teve um momento mais especial, que foi em 2013. Eu escrevi um post, como eu escrevi sobre vários assuntos, assim, que eu vou falar o machismo, a homofobia, o racismo. É, o preconceito social, o preconceito político. E um post especificamente, chamava Pelo Direito dos Meninos, ele viralizou. A partir da minha página, eu acho que foram 50 mil pessoas que compartilharam, mas ele foi ficado em vários lugares. É, foi o, o que eu escrevi, assim, que mais ser perguntinho. Só por que era isso aqui? Eu falava sobre a criação machista, muito comum, que é dado aos meninos do Brasil, e pedindo que fosse diferente. Os pais, as mães, e as pessoas que têm contato com crianças, os tios, os é, padrinhos, as madrinhas, se comportassem diferente com os meninos. Permitindo assim, né? que os meninos se tornassem pessoas sensíveis, que podem chorar, que podem dançar, que podem... É, se expressar é, de uma maneira que não tem que corresponder ao estereótipo do machão. Principalmente nesse texto, eu falava sobre o, o horror que é a exposição precoce que vimos a pornografia, o que ainda não ficou no Brasil. Assim, depois com a repercussão do texto, várias mães me procuraram, né, mães que estão em conflito com o marido, ou os ex-maridos, pais e seus filhos, é, que sofrem vendo os pais mostrando pornografia para meninos de 5, 6 anos, como uma prevenção que eles não se tornarem sexuais. E depois da interrupção desse meu texto, eu também, é, vários meninos, jovens gays, procuraram para relatar e é, viver uma educação muito muita pressão, assim, de pais machistas que se reconheceram na vida. Fora isso, também recebi mensagens é, quase sempre de homens identificados é, em seus perfis com o candidato a presidente de extrema direita do Partido de Bolsonaro. Esses homens, né, que identificados com esse candidato, eles falavam que deveria morrer, que eu deveria sair do Brasil, e aquilo que eu estava falando sobre os pais acolherem seus filhos, é, se, se eles forem homossexuais, porque eu era uma tentativa minha de fazer um muito grande, e é, o certo era bater, né, ou ficar de casa, coisas assim. Bom, esse texto é de 2013, Teve uma reflexão na época e depois é, diminuiu-as. Aí agora, esse ano, em 2016, é, 
no mês passado, aconteceu um fato que chocou muito os brasileiros, mas assim, principalmente aqui no estado onde eu moro atualmente, em Goiás, na capital goiana, é, o pai matou o próprio filho, 20 anos, chamado Guilherme Nietzsche, é, na cidade de matemática, é, que tinha entrado na comunidade italiana. Então, assim, ele, o pai e o filho eles tinham muito conflito porque o, esse menino se dizia humanista, anarquista, ele estava envolvido com movimentos sociais, né? É, e o pai discordava muito das opiniões. É, e o pai desse menino, o estupim, assim, da, o conflito entre eles foi que o Guilherme começou a participar das ocupações, apoiar as ocupações das escolas, é, que é uma forma de protesto contra o governo atual, que é prejudicar a educação pública. E ele caiu para aí nesse, nesse protesto, vai até atrás. E no meio do caminho, atirou no filho, carregou a arma, atirou até matar e depois matou. Bom, no dia seguinte, a screen, que eu já estava chocada com ele, que eu fui avisada, e o Guilherme, antes de morrer, pouco antes de morrer, ele compartilhou meu texto. Esse meu texto pedi para os pais. É, Educar isso de uma maneira diferente, assim, não artista. É, ele compartilhou ele, assim, a gente ficou com esse texto, e, e o texto voltou a circular, a viralizar, e, e aí aconteceu um fenômeno que, assim, um, três dias depois, o texto começou a ser compartilhado com o seu próprio cliente, com uma carta dele, com a autoria dele. Assim, muita gente compartilhou, até um ex-ministro da educação. O brasileiro compartilhou como o seu texto fosse um bom. Aí um amigo meu foi lá e falou: Ó, oh, o texto era meu. E esse ex-ministro mudou, assim como outras pessoas também identificaram. E aí um jornal de Goiânia, chamado Popular, publicou uma matéria falando que o texto era que esse ministro morreu. E eu fui entrar para avisar: só era, na verdade, esse texto é meu. Ele compartilhou o texto e me explicou, só que eu comecei a ler é, os comentários, né? e eu fiquei extremamente chocada por é, essa os, os comentários do, do popular eles são muito piores do que os do G1, do que os do UOL, do que os grandes portais. Né? A maioria das pessoas lá, elas apoiavam o Batman. Então, eu penso assim que a gente... Eu não imagino um limite a ler esse, assim. A pessoa apoiar um pai que mata um filho, pelo motivo do filho, pelo opiniões diferentes da lei. Assim. É, e era uma vez como era. Não era um ou outro é, soando, não. Assim. A maioria, alguns falavam assim, ah, não, eu acho que não vai chegar a matar. Poderia ter expulsado de casa, poderia ter tirado todo o dinheiro dele, poderia ter batido nele, mas não precisava de ter é, matado, né, assim, ou algum que até compreendido antes. É, bom, acontece a história que aconteceu comigo, recentemente. Eu queria fazer duas perguntas. Assim. É, uma primeira pergunta é, acabou. O que você acha que pode ser feito para Contei as notícias falsas que se encontram na internet. Assim, já em maior quantidade do que, do que as notícias de fato, né? Esses boatos que vêm no formato que parece de notícia, que reforçam muitos discursos de ódio, ou, né, no caso, como aconteceu comigo, também é, colocam um sensacionalismo é, nas mesmas notícias. Assim. O que, é que pode ser feito? Assim? O que é que. É, o Facebook, as redes sociais, como resolver essa questão assim, da mentira hoje ser muito mais forte do que a verdade, assim, no compartilhamento, na informação da opinião das pessoas. Uma outra pergunta que eu queria fazer é mais pessoal, 
para cima. Eu queria saber se em algum momento você perdeu a paciência. Assim. Algo que eu tenho contato com muito discurso de ódio, muito argumento absurdo. Se você já reagiu de um jeito que não gostaria, assim, que aqui te colocou numa raiva, que você falou coisas que você não gostaria de ter falado, de uma forma que você acha que não encontrou nada para fazer uma mudança. É, se isso já aconteceu com você, eu queria que você contasse. E também falasse o que você acha que as pessoas que tentam lutar contra essa maré conservadora, que tenta limitar o direito das pessoas, é, esse discurso da meritocracia, é, e defesa das desigualdades, como a gente pode enfrentar isso? Sem em algum momento adoecer, né? Não está fundamental, ou se contaminar com, com, com esse ódio e perder a paciência, e às vezes reagir de uma forma é, que só aumenta os conflitos sem, sem aumentar o entendimento das pessoas sobre nada. O que, é que você faz, o que, é que você recomenda? Right. So we probably could um, uh, have him uh, yeah. get uh, <coughs> questions from you for all the for Sakamoto. For, uh, well, unfortunately, she will not. I mean, Silvia Mele cannot reply because it's a video. But to the presenters and uh, all of them, and then we go. Yeah, she's Let's she's watching it live, and she sent another questions. And we would like to invite uh, our entities to to, uh, yeah, to mediate and to contribute to the discussion that will be now open to the to the audience and also to the audience online. Uh, uh, well, so uh, the first question. Uh, it's been yeah, sent by. He, is, uh, he wants to ask a question. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sure. Do you have a microphone for questions? Uh, no, I'm not really, because this is for okay. okay. But yeah, uh, everybody. First will. of all, my name is Paul Dier. I am the president of ABEP. I would like to also to take the chance to thank Sakamoto, thank Sylvia, Stephanie, Polly, especially Bianca, Gabi, everybody for making this very good uh, event. It's the second Café Brasil that you see already, as you know, our board have organized. Thank you, Pinka. And uh, talking about hate and tolerance, I have about this uh, dark side of the moon. It recalls me, meets me to a uh, text from Sigmund Freud, The Malaise in uh, Civilization, yeah. when he talks about the <coughs> instinct of death and instinct of life living together, fighting for. In civilization, and also also repeats me. Uh, although Sakamoto, it, it doesn't matter whether he believes or not. It's not a question of belief, but there is a myth, a Bible myth. The first two brothers won't kill the other. So it also, I don't know who killed him, whom, Caim or Abel, Abel or Caim, but won't kill the other. The first two brothers, the first couple. So this is a myth. This also uh, uh, shows up how humanity is, I guess, uh, in these terms of hate and intolerance. But uh, I would like to, uh, to point the other side of it. I mean, when you say uh, intolerance, I think about, uh, when you say about hate, I think about love. When, and when there's somebody saying war in one side, you need to say peace in the other side, otherwise the war speech will win and we have war. And uh, uh, in these terms of intolerance, we also need to talk about tolerance. And uh, uh, what I would like to ask the board and Sakamoto and also everybody here, so how far can we be tolerant? I guess we need to have to be tolerant with all this hatred, with all these things, but there's a limit for this. You need to say no, there's no hatred. The hatred cannot uh, prevail in, in between us. If you want to keep with your hatred, do something to keep it, or how can we deal with it? So how far can we be Tolerant. We, we uh, uh, in, in the speech of intolerance, we should say, to, let's be tolerant. But we can all, cannot always be tolerant. We have a limit for it. 
but we can also also we cannot fall in the same uh, side of hate and intolerance. But we, we need to have a limit. So which limit can we think about? More questions? Let's put. Uh, let's put yeah. Yeah, my name is Thiago. I, I try to be short. In my question to uh, I think to the, uh, address to Leonardo, but picking some things that uh, Stefani and Pauli said. I understood that. Uh, we have different levels of uh, the discursive from the discursive point of view. We have different levels of uh, sources of conflicts. At the one level is like this kind of expressions, uh, Stephanie, uh, that are ideologically broken, especially in the, in the current situation that is that is very politically stressed. You know, uh, very polarized. Like you say, Pochinha Petralha, and you have, it's, it's almost, I like this, this uh, idea of repente uh, as well. It's almost like they say, oh, you need this? No, everybody, you know, it triggers like yes. a, some, some kind of answers by, by everybody. But uh, on the other side, we don't have, you don't necessarily have this kind of politically or ideologically broken uh, uh, words or expressions. But uh, as much as, uh, as Pauli said, People don't listen to each other and uh, get violent. And Leonardo Sakamoto wrote uh, in between, uh, from page 98 to page 103 of his book, uh, something very fantastic that I, I love to read this uh, when I'm quite depressed or not so uh, quite sad, because he takes a very simple sentence that's used for the alphabetization of children in Brazil, well, at least in the, until the 80s or so, which is vovó viu a uva, like yeah. the grandma saw the grapefruit. Of course, the phonetic uh, game, word game, vovó viu a uva. So, and he, he explores like different interpretation, interpretations from the point of view of feminism, of, uh, of a religious, like an evangelical uh, point of view, or Marxist point of view, imperialist, and so on. Like, as a simple uh, phrase, you know, and at the end, is no. This means that simply the, like vovó viu a uva significa que vovó viu a uva. I, uh, in this sense, in this sense, I like to uh, to to ask Sakamoto how to cope with this. Uh, well, I think that we agree uh, upon the the problem, but how to deal with this problem? How, how is the solution for uh, for getting the message? Uh, Put, put across. No? How can can we how can we solve this problem of interpretation? Is the problem of the who, who writes the message? Problem of who, who is reading the message? How can we? Is the is the solution the school? Okay, so let's answer this uh, set of questions, and then we make three more. Let's do it like this yeah, because cool. we have also the questions posted by uh, Sylvia Mendes. So, may I do late first? <laughs> <laughs> or do you prefer to ask? Uh, I think she okay, so they didn't accept that, Leonardo. So they want you to answer first the questions that were posed to you. Thank well, you for the questions. Uh, thank you. There, there were several questions, in fact, including the video. Um, I'll start by the, the comments in the video and then comment what 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 to. What, what you can do. It's quite complicated because uh, it's, uh, there are several levels of attacks. For example, in my case, I need to spend some time in the United States because it wasn't, when I talk about uh, being accused online, it's not just being accused, it's death threats, it's physical violence, it's uh, people, uh, people running um, uh, to, 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 to punch me on the streets. Then I, I had to spend some time in New York uh, as a Eastern scholar of uh, New School to try to, to, to wait to calm down the situation here. And at the same time, I, I believe that there are different levels uh, that one can do. There is the, the, the personal level, of course, that if you can try to see everything if you're with a good humor, good humor um, try to see these as the well, the person, the person really doesn't know you. 
that if the, person, the most part of the people that uh, choose someone online or make traffic, if the person look at you in front by front, face by face, the person won't have the same uh, behavior. Then, of course, that uh, it's complicated, but the, the most part of time I try to, to I, I really don't care. I really don't care the most part of the, the case. Of course, that there are some cases where it involves physical integrity or moral integrity or some kind of violence when the person um, doesn't consider the limits, the legal limits. I'm talking about uh, I'm talking about legal limits. I'm talking about uh, um, uh, how how far you can go in, in your right. And when you study, when you analyze human rights, you, you know that each human right. The limit of human right is given by the, the, the limits of the another one. And uh, of course, that the freedom of speech is a human right, and uh, the, the, all, all kinds of freedom of um, public manifestation is human right. And at the same time, this kind of right doesn't um, allow preview censorship, of course. But uh, at the same time, um, if uh, you use your right to, to try to, to kill the right of someone or to try to kill someone or to try to move the society against a group, an entire group or an entire or a person, then you extrapolate your right. And then according to the law, not just the Brazilian law, but the international law uh, concerning about human rights, you can be, you can be prosecuted. You can be uh, put in a trial, complete. And uh, because this kind of uh, speech is not a speech about opinion, but a speech that try to is to, um, to to kill the, the other person, to kill the other person that we feel you you should dialogue. Well, um, there is no easy answer to that, but uh, I talk all the time with my psychoanalyst. That then he talks a lot about that. Uh, well, you, your limit is very big, you say, because you are for 10 years experiencing this kind of thing, but the most part of people doesn't allow this to limit this kind of to, to, to have a, a higher limit. I, I don't have a, a final answer, but uh, first to try to, to calm down, try to analyze if there's, there is a a hate speech against you, or against something that you believe, or against something uh, uh, against someone that the other person doesn't know, really doesn't know. And if there is some, if that occurs uh, some crime, some this speech is trying to to exterminate you or or the group that you that belongs to, go to the federal prosecutor office, to the general attorney office, make a, 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 a complaint. It's important to that. It's important to put limits. There is no um, the, the legal law of this area. It's, it's much new and much young. It's necessary to people to go um, to the justice, necessary jurisprudence to be needed. And this is just happened with you if you make complaints, if you go to, to this. Um, I try to be shorter, sorry. But. Um, I, I believe that um, the best way of this, the, 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 well, the interpretation problem will exist forever. Because the message just, will just, um, uh, will just uh, be complete when the, the, the people, uh, someone receives this message. And between the intention from the, the person that, uh, that uh, broadcasts the message and the perception uh, of this message by someone that received it, there is an entire world. And the message to be 100% clear is necessary to be this re receptor, uh, share the same symbolic elements, the same point of views, the same language element with the person that's broadcasting the, the, the message. And uh, if the message is very simple, it can be done. And then if you can, if you see the, the major TV broadcasting shows, the major 
and news shows in the television, they use a very simple uh, message. But if you try to use irony, if you try to use some some, some kind of uh, source of language, then it will be very difficult. And the problem is that internet, internet, the miracle in the internet is not the person not to understand irony, is a person who understands irony. It's almost impossible to share the same elements to 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 to, to bend the meaning of some some words. And I believe that um, the how to solve the problem of interpretation is if you want to be uh, one hundred percent clear the internet, try to use a simple messages, and at the same time, it's necessary to train people. Each, each student, student is in the beginning to have patience, to have patience to understand the, the message, to, to, to keep understanding the message, try to, to understand, try to realize that the environment, the context of the, the person that works gets a message could be different from you. And these take time. This is one of the things that we can imagine in a very good education for human rights. Education to have patients with the, the different, with the other that has a different environment of the message than you. Um, uh, well, uh, just to try to just one one, one little thing uh, about the comments that uh, was uh, to comment that there's some question that uh, some comments what that was given in debate. Um, there is two kind of comments. There is two kind of. Uh, actions in the internet, about the comments in the internet. You have the spontaneous comments for regular people, ordinary people, and you, and you have the coordinate actions. Um, I, 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 I interviewed here in Brazil some people, some um, owners of um, some little companies that exist to, that are uh, profile farms. They, the companies, they have, um, they, they have uh, several fake profiles that are uh, feed by professional people that stay years and years feeding profiles on Facebook with information. They are fake people with, um, that, that looks like uh, real people. And these real people is used, uh, is hired by politicians, by companies here in Brazil, to, 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 to try to, to influence the opinion of people during elections or when a company wants to launch a product. The problem that there are some politicians, and one of them was uh, quoted uh, 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 some time ago, was some politicians as Jair Bolsonaro, ex extreme right wing politician in Brazil, and Jair Bolsonaro. Have, and their family have um, their own uh, fake profile farms. And these farms are used to spread out this kind of hate speech, but not just a hate speech. There are coordinated to attack some groups and some people, some other politics. And some time of them, the results of this is uh, physical violence. I know that because we have some cases. This kind of case, in my opinion, should be uh, uh, should, should be uh, that should be prohibited by the Brazilian uh, uh, justice because these kind of actions are not to, to politicize or to spread out some opinion from this group, from a extreme right wing group that he belongs, but is exactly to kill or exactly to extinguish their opponents. This is very, very dangerous, and this is rising in Brazil. Thank you, Leonard. Uh, so, would you like to? I'll do it very briefly. Yeah. Um, um, I mean, I think I have been thinking a lot about this because I have a thirteen-year-old, and I think that's the worst possible time in recent history, though. You know, to have a 13 year old coming into this world seem to be an adult. Uh, um, something that does occur to me is, um, you know, in terms of what, what can we do? This question of fake profiles um, that Leonardo mentioned is fake profiles, is fake news. 
we teach our kids, well, allegedly, we teach our kids to be able to read, to be able to deconstruct novels, to be able to read films, but we're not necessarily, there isn't a, a, a subject as such called reading social media. Mm -hmm. So we warn kids about how to be safe online, and the parents always see that information, but they're not taught how to understand what happens online, particularly with regard to social media. Um, I mean, I think I'm pretty good at, at identifying fake profiles, but it's amazing the number of people that I interact with on Facebook who don't seem to get, you know, that someone who has commented something negative is it's actually a robot. Mm -hmm. And it's, so there's a lack of a, a visual literacy, but also social media literacy, if you like, spotting fake news stories, spotting, spotting fake memes, knowing how to check things like that. So that could be incorporated. And it's ideologically friendly. You know, it doesn't, you know, it would fit, you know, who swallow same attitude, it will fit any kind of, uh, you know, sort of like um, schooling type system. It doesn't need to be tied to any particular ideology. So I think that's that's something that would be useful. Um, no, it's okay, go ahead. Well, I've got, again, a random series of points, I'll say, but I think one of the things, one of the things that's very difficult about this idea of controlling fake stories or, you know, misinformation and also controlling these negative messages is that the very tools they're using are the tools that, you know, sort of more we would see as progressive, you know, um, left leaning, but you know, certainly, you know, more democratic, all these kind of values. We're using those tools to try and counter other forms of misinformation. So we identify, you know, activists use it, but also people by sharing stories. So we're using the same tools. So to say we need to you know, have much tighter controls, it involves a lot of risks. Um, so it's, you know, it's not just about spreading hate. And I think social media does that you know, in very particular ways. It offers new ways of spreading threats. It's a, it, you know, it offers that illusion of anonymity. Um, but it also allows you to reproduce crime and re-victimize people. So by sharing videos of violent acts, for example, then it reproduces that. Um, and it, I think a third use of it though, so, so the, the sort of the threats, there's the reproduction of, the, of those, um, of that hate, but there's also spreading the, that, that's, that misinformation. But it depends if you're talking about individuals or groups, I think that's also important because I think, you know, a lot of what um, Leonardo's talking about is very, you know, personalised, individualised. Um, and, but sometimes you're talking about the general spreading of hate against groups that is, is a bit more sort of generalized and then it, again it's sort of you know you're not talking about clear individuals who are doing it you're not talking about clear victims who are doing it so then instead of talking about the law as being the method by which you're going to remedy that i think is really problematic because the law isn't necessarily the place where you're going to address bigotry so you might be sending out message normative messages about what is the limits of what's acceptable and what's not which has a certain value, but it's not going to actually necessarily change people's minds. So it might change the way they express them or where they express views. It doesn't necessarily, so I mean, it's different if you're talking about a company setting up a Facebook account, you've got a clear target there and it's, it's, it's more about just the symbolic value. But I think when you're talking about these generalized messages, I do think it goes much more back to, you know, education skills. And I think that it's not just about the skills of leading, but it's about the skills of engaging. And who do you engage with and when do you engage with and how do you do that? Which I think Sylvia also talked about, you know, how do you how do you engage in a calm way with people who are expressing very horrific views? And if you're engaging with them, are you actually tacitly condoning them as well? So although I think it's right to say, you know, you should be doing that, there's a certain point where you have to say, if I keep on trying to engage in this conversation, I'm essentially saying that what you're saying is valid. Hmm. I just add one last one little thing. Yes, because I actually, right. have, I actually yeah. have to go in a minute because said 13 year old is waiting for me in my office yeah. by herself. So I have to go. I just wanted to add one, one thing because I lost my train of thought. And it was to, to um, you, someone brought up the fact that we're Brazil, the Brazilian context, things are so uh, divided at the moment politically that one of the th things that I experience as a, as a researcher wanting to keep abreast of what's going on in Brazil is that um, I have my you know reliable sources of information if you like that are probably going to fit in with my own you know political ideology needless to say which means that I don't get to hear the other side very often mm -hmm. um, and when I've tried to engage with friends on Facebook who are you know of a particular persuasion I've tried to suggest well isn't that isn't it something slightly different than that I find 
I actually have reflected on the fact that really the, this was last year when this happened and I got shouted down by people I don't even know for daring to suggest. I think what I said was that the British press were not calling um, the impeachment situation a coup. Someone had said, look, even the British press are calling a coup. And I simply corrected them factually but got completely shot down by, by mm -hmm. making that factual correction. And I actually acknowledged it and said, I'm sorry, I see that this is clearly not the right time to be picking up on these factual, you know, it, it clearly wasn't. And it's been going on ever since where I find it very difficult to find anyone, um, who, you know, sort of, yeah, liberal, left-leaning, however you want to define them, who's actually prepared to give a bit of space for someone who doesn't, who is a part of that. Yeah. And I just wanted to mention, because this is something that I spotted on um, Leonardo's blog, uh, for the first time, I was able to read an interview um, with uh, someone who I had assumed was just simply part of the Bancada Evangelica. Uh, she's pays a bit she must be this, she must be that, because the situation makes us think that that would be the case. They actually happened to be quite open-minded. I assume that Leonardo would agree, um, having interviewed her, that she was quite prepared to talk. This was, um, what's the name, Patricia Bezeja the new mi minority uh, person in the, in the it's the city of Sao Paulo government isn't it they actually had very open-minded things to say about the position of women in society perhaps not about other things because she wasn't asked those questions but very open-minded and actually giving space to someone who wasn't part of a previous sort of PT project I've not I've not seen anyone else do that so it's just you know we need to start thinking about giving space to, to other voices as well yeah just to, just to make a comment, <coughs> if you don't mind, yeah. Um, I, I agree with the. Um, I, I, I didn't say that uh, I believe that the law is the best way to solve the problems. I'm saying just the, to, 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 to model this new environment and to understand what the limits that we have uh, on this. We need to, to the different ways, the different paths will be used to that. I'm not saying that uh, because there is no uh, uh, unique process to, 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 to shape, shape opinion using uh, social networks. There are, I'm not saying, there is, um, you have millions of people that, that never had access to the information in great big scale that suddenly uh, jump on the internet. People that was never listening for anything or telling uh, uh, anything about their opinions in a very big grade of information. At the same time, you have uh, you have groups in extreme in right extreme wing here in Brazil that uh, for the first time has access for the first time since the end of the dictatorship period 1985 has access to uh, tools to broadcast it and to share out their all their opinions and all their information. There are so many groups, and there are so many people interacting <clears throat> now in the internet, interacting with each other now in the internet in Brazil. And it's difficult because each group, different groups, and different people has, um, uh, 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 you need to be uh, analyzed in a different way. When I'm talking about the, the need of education <clears throat> in a higher scale, is not with a uh, a uh, specific subject, but in a transversal way, in a, right, in human rights, in the media literacy, and so on. Something it's something important to uh, to a certain group. Get the, the support from the media, the media to, to, to help on this. It's important too because, in my opinion, for example, <clears throat> that website, the, the websites that try to check facts that we have a lot in Brazil, we have a lot in several places. This doesn't mean this doesn't work in, 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 a, in, a, in a higher scale too. We need the, 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 the big media working on that. We need the big media working to help to 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 to, to, to not not uh, uh, to to in this interaction in this media literacy process and so on. But at the same time, we need the justice. We need the force of law. Unfortunately. I know that's not the best way, but we that to avoid um, uh, some elements, some people that are using uh, the network to take advantage of this moment, 
was you. It's a very complicated moment, it's a polarized moment. That we're using this to, 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 to as if it crimes, in fact. And then we need the, 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 the limits imposed by law. I know that's not the best, but I believe in the basket of solutions. And uh, uh, now in Brazil, and looking what's happening, I believe that, of course, that the law would, uh, it would, won't be uh, able to stop a father that will kill uh, the son. But uh, at the same time, the law will, yes, will the example of the law in some case can stop some, some behaviors because the, 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 the perception here among a lot of people is that uh, you can do anything in the internet different here that what happens in the real world. Sorry, I don't know if I... Okay, well, now we have more questions. One, two, you go first and then Andrea and then Helm. Thank you. Uh, Good. Okay. Actually, I haven't got uh, a question. It's more like an interesting fact that I would like to share with you all. Um, I mean, if, if you're talking about, you know, what can be done to prevent uh, hate speech, and I also think this is a good, you know, thing that Brazil can learn from, from Britain. Obviously, there is a lot going on outside about, you know, Brexit, the referendum, like living in the European Union. And then I remember a couple of weeks ago, there was uh, obviously the Daily Mail, the newspaper. Um, there was something going on about uh, the high court in, in Britain uh, judging about if the, the British Parliament would have a say or not on delivering Brexit. And then the day next, uh, they published like a photos of all the judges and the Daily Mail said this is, you know, the enemies of the British people. And then I think the decent side of the moon, they got so fed up with all, you know, the hate speech. Then they launched a campaign called Stop Funding Hate using hashtag, using, you know, all the media source. Let's stab the source using the same knife. And that actually worked quite well. Like, you know, they, they wrote emails to Lego, to Strongball, say like, listen, you are, you know, your money is being used, you know, to spread hate around the country and this is not good. Like, me, if I'm a parent, I'm not buying Lego to my children. They, they just, you know, stop all the funds they will send it to the Daily Mail, like weekly. They decide to reduce, like, you know, fortnightly and then maybe once a month. And then if you can see, like from that day to now, the Daily Mail changed, like, uh, the way they express the COVID page. So, you know, it's working. So, sh shall we do the same in Brazil? You know, that's why I have to keep asking myself. And the question is posed to everybody present here in the, the cyberspace. Andre. So, I don't have a lot of uh, knowledge about the situation in Brazil in terms of hate and intolerance, but I kind of see from what I read online myself is. These hate speeches, this uh, lack of intolerance of other opinions, is driven by a uh, unwillingness to understand and agree with someone's opinion. And for me, a lot of say lay people who maybe not work with it, they comment on economics, politics, humanity, gear, ethical questions. I look at them well, from my take last year, take Donald Trump. And the things he tweeted uh, about his opponents, about uh, un unreal facts, and how it was quickly pointed out by several medias, other people, how it was wrong. It was uh, it was uh, like you called Hillary a nasty woman. You shouldn't call your political opponent a nasty woman, at least not live television. But still, he didn't lose any votes. His supporters were embracing his uh, tweets, and as soon as anyone, anyone came with a different opinion, they turned a deaf ear. So I'm wondering how can you, how are, where are we in society where politicians and people which are in the media can get away with it? How can you kind of combat, or not combat, how can you change that whole acceptance? Because clearly it's a social acceptance that you don't need anymore to have the facts on your side. It's enough for you to post anything, and your supporters would gladly accept it. And the people that tries to show other opinions will not be heard. How do we voice all the... Then we have another question. And I have to say that I, <coughs> I, I put myself to raise questions too. So <laughs> that they don't seem like a coup. I'm going to I'm going to ask my my questions after him. 
Okay. Thank you. Uh, I will try to be quick. Uh, Leonardo, considering your experience, uh, your particular experience, are there any attempts to establish specific institutional frameworks in Brazil in order to protect journalists or human rights activists following uh, the examples of Colombia or Mexico who has different institutions or not? Just, uh, so he can, ah. uh, uh, can just speak a bit the second point is about uh, following the, the talk. Uh, we can see that uh, politics are playing a huge role in terms of um, uh, polarization of the society. But what about uh, economic inequalities? Are they playing also a role in uh, the, um, uh, increasing the social polarization and radicalization of hate and intolerance? There are my two questions. Thank you. Thank you for the questions. And I have three questions to everybody present here we, for us to think about. First question is, what would be a simple message that we are talking about? What is a simple message? Where is it that there are no noises in the messages and different interpretations? Second question, what does it really mean for us this idea of sharing symbolic uh, codes. Because my question is due to the fact that it's very easy for us to talk with people who share the codes, the same code with us. The problem of hatred and violence is exactly called difference, not sameness, difference. And one, when between you and me, between us, we can discuss ideas like, do we legalize the internet space or don't we? But we know we share the same symbolic code, right? But the, the, the challenge is Bolsonaro and whatever he represents in all sorts, in gender issues and everything, in everyday life, in schooling and all. And all. Last question. Do we realize that we are the other of the, our other? And that is, so there was a joke uh, uh, circulating on TV, uh, on a, as a, on a Facebook the other day. I shared it. I, and it went like this. The boy asks the father, how dad, what if we kill all the bad people, all the people who are wrong. We will be solving the problem, won't we? And the dad answered, no, we will be all murderers, right? So that's the issue. We are the others of our other. To talk amongst us is cool. What is the limit of tolerance? Should tolerance have a limit? That's my question. Okay, and we want to. I ended my question for now. And uh, you want to. I have a question that, that is somehow related because uh, okay. uh, I, I was reading Hannah Arendt, uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, Eichmann in Jerusalem, and uh, and the banality of evil. Mm -hmm. And I think it relates to what we've been seeing because I've already discussed that with Sylvia. Uh, because uh, in this last, in this, the previous process of the elections, what became very uh scary <laughs> to be honest was that the violence didn't come from uh, people that you would classify as evil it didn't come from violent like from uh, literally and like clearly violent people but it came from your uncle your auntie uh your neighbor that would like serve you nice cakes and that that's very scary so i, I would like to address this question especially especially for Polly and then Silvana. Uh, the other one left. Uh, and uh, yeah, and also about this about this last comment uh, that Silvana addressed. Uh, it, it reminds me of uh, the Lord of the Flies, because mm -hmm. like there, there when you throw uh, really nice kids in an island, you like they are capable of everything, and, and it reminds me of this uh, this uh, Eichmann process because the banality of evil came from the conclusion that from uh, Anna Harden, that uh, she she uh, she went to the United States running uh, from the from the Nazi and she concluded 
that Eichmann was not a monster. He was a normal person, and that was the the most uh, that that was the revelation that normal people are capable of doing really evil things. So it's it's not it, you don't have to see a the a archetype person. of the devil yeah. devil and anyway. Well, thank you. Great, great, great. A good person, a good father, right? Yeah, good fathers. They, they can. <laughs> All right. Now we are going to have the answers, and then Gary is already in the list for next question. So we, if we go too long, it's a lot. No, okay. Want to, okay, raise your question. My question would just a comment. You know, in the United States, there's the phenomenon, the problem that in elections, money is speech. Uh, that it was decided by the Supreme Court that you can say that, that a political uh, foundation can say anything and it's nobody is speaking. It's, it's, it's just money. And actually this is Trump. Uh, money it was speaking. And uh, when that said, they tell any lies. They've been telling lies uh, since Reagan's time. Um, you know, and so it's understood, or we could understand, that money tells lies. So like, that's I think how Trump gets out of it. He says, oh, we should kill Hillary. We should put her in prison. We should do this. But it doesn't matter. I think one of the problems you're facing, Leonardo, is that you put yourself out there and you say what you think. You know, you're a real person and everybody knows that the speech there is lie speech. The, that we see this the speech of these and so there's this problem of the robots and the money they say whatever they want they discount truth there's no truth and so somehow you know it it, it makes this asymmetry of power uh, that has to be addressed I, I think I end up where you end up that we have to go to educate and to civilize this space because otherwise the internet will be used to silence any opposition to tell any lie, and we'll be living in 1984 uh, world. You know, truth is freedom, and truth is false. You know, the, all that stuff. You know, slavery is freedom. All those things. Nothing will be anything. We'll destroy <clears throat> our capacity to communicate. All right. So, who wants to go first between the two of you? What do you look at well, I've got, I've got one, I suppose, because there's lots of different points, and I think it's all very true. I don't think we can do justice to all those different questions. But I, I, I just think, I'm glad that I think at this round of questions, more the, the, the issue of politics has come up. And I think, um, I can't remember who said it now. This, this is the problem when so many people <laughs> raise questions. But, um, you know, I don't think this hate is just about a lack of willingness to engage or tolerate others. I think it has got much more to do with power and it's about you know people who are feeling threatened people who you know have got a certain position in a hierarchy they might not be at the top but they do have it and they feel threatened and so it, the, the, the speech of the hate speech or, or the hate acts they actually are used to preserve those hierarchies and to justify that difference and 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 so on because they feel Trend, which does relate a little bit to the banality thing because I think you know it might be shocking when we discover that someone like him is you know on other levels a decent person but that is not that's a myth anyway it's not it's not that you know the, all the work on, on domestic violence shows that very clearly it's normal men you know or people who were you know um, or we have Jimmy Savile that totally debunks that myth but most people who commit you know sexual abuse against children are relatively normal people they're not weird people who come out you know like ogres out from under the bed they are normal um and 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 a lot of what they do is about preserving a sense of power and i think that is really really key to what what happens and it's not and i think maybe if we get too involved in what they're saying we miss out that bigger picture mm -hmm. um which is, of course, why money speaks, right? Because it's those with money who have the power to, to, to set that process in motion. So that's my, my only point. Yeah, yeah but that, that's the point. Yeah. That's the point. Yeah. And the big power and the micro power. And micro, I don't know. 
would you like to uh, learn out? Thank you very much. Uh, would you like to <coughs> learn out that you briefly uh, reply to the second no. question? Um, about the, uh, the framework to protection journalists in Brazil, um, there is not, in fact. Um, in fact, we, we have some support for unions, we have some support from organizations as the Brazilian Association of, Brazil, of uh, Investigative Journalists. And uh, the Brazilian government, the former Brazilian government, had some uh, actions to try to protect journalists, but this, is, um, this has been uh, useless. Uh, according to uh, reports from the report, uh, reports without borders, Brazil is one of the worst countries uh, to journalists. Uh, journalists have, uh, have been murdered in the countryside. To be journalists in the countryside in Brazil is very, very dangerous. Even in the capitals, we have less kind of things, kind of threats happening. Imagine the journalists, the little, the, you know, from little companies inside the country then we sometimes we have some, we ask help sometimes from the, the reporters from the united nations or the american space organization uh, about freedom of speech to report and saying what's what's happening it's complicated because brazil is not under a war and uh, we have some sometimes some <coughs> rates of murder of journalists close to, to causes in the war. About uh, the inequality, and uh, of course that, uh, this is interesting, but uh, uh, the environment the, of last years in Brazil, we are suffering a very strong economic crisis because the international scenario, but because bad decisions from the former Brazilian government, from Dilma Rousseff. And uh, this means that some some groups that were from poor classes and during good life years rose and rise and, uh, and reach some consumed power and uh, they suffered so much more than other social classes here in Brazil. It's interesting because uh, Lula started to call uh, as a middle class, lower middle class, what in fact were um, poor classes with power of consumption in fact. And, uh, after, uh, and the, uh, the citizenship, uh, the gate for citizenship was the, the possibility to buy products, television, uh, smartphones, and so on. And now these groups are losing their oldest consumption power and they are facing uh, troubles and they are very angry yeah. these because they are not feeling themselves more as citizens. Um, and these groups of this situation are more uh, vulnerable of this uh, situation, economic crisis, to some groups that are bringing some speeches that uh, that bring all that the blame of this are from the Bolivians and people from Haiti that come and try to steal your jobs, or the, the, the responsibility are the poor people from the northeast area in Brazil that come to Sao Paulo and we generate senior jobs, or, uh, or that they, these are blamed from this lefty uh, politi economic politics. We need some uh, a strong right pol economic politics. It's interesting because this is not from just from Brazil. We are, we are seeing this orphans from this orphans from globalization in UK with the Brexit or in the election of uh, Donald Trump um, are Donald Trump talking a lot with the poor people from the uh, the areas uh, that lost industrialization and uh, show it um, another way to get American rail again and get the jobs again even that we know that this won't work but they, they show they show to these people that uh, were very disappointed with the, this global liberal solution. And it happens the same in Brazil. And we are very afraid, as, uh, as you told, that we are very afraid as a guy, as Jair Bolsonaro, that has uh, good rates of voting tension among the higher classes in Brazil. There is a, a research from Data Folha that shows that. We are afraid that. Uh, 
uh, um, they, they, they rise in the hate, have real power to reach 2018 presidential election with chances. To, just to finish, um, well, I believe that uh, almost everybody knows who Paulo Freire is, one of the Brazilian major educators known worldwide. Uh, Paulo Freire used to say that uh, the problem is not the ideology. And uh, is if your ideology is inclusive, or it is excluded, or inclusive. Um, then the problem is that um, uh, when we're talking about the others, and it's, it's right, this is our way to see the best, uh, uh, is, is our point of view of what is the best way for the humankind. But this is our ideology, we choose one. I believe, I believe that this is my ideology, and I'm not saying the mine as a leftist guy from Brazil, from the late American Council, but I'm, not, I'm just I'm saying an ideology that's including human rights is the best way that you have and the, the best construction that you made along the human history would be better than we really, have, uh, really were. And uh, I believe that uh, any, any ideology that tries to destroy uh, the idea of human rights is an ideology that. Uh, I stay, I stay concerned about this, and um, it's. Uh, I believe that any ideology that wants to destroy the another one is the the concerned one. It's, it's, it's not the enemy, but it's someone to be understood and uh, and uh, and uh, discussed. And about uh, um, a simple idea, I like one one. Uh, Sentence that I say a lot in my texts. In Portuguese, makes a lot of sense, but there is a lack of the word, but that's a lack of text interpretation. And um, I believe this so much. I mean, that uh, we need, <laughs> of course, that uh, we, need, we need to take care more uh, from each other, but at the same time, we need patience to understand what the other person is saying uh, before taking decisions about it ourselves and about themselves. Thank you very much. And there are more questions. Um, okay, Annie? Yes, <laughs> Annie. Um, it's just, uh, I think, um, I, I think most of my friends must be sharing the same situation too, where it's very common now that we have those WhatsApp groups with our family members. And our families, you know, our, our parents and relatives, uh, keep posting those hate messages uh, about racism, uh, homophobic jokes, um, comments saying that uh, our swearing at our own country, saying it's it's not worth to live in Brazil. That, for example, they even tell me, "Oh, Bianca, you're studying abroad. Why don't you just stay in England? Don't come back because you know Brazil is a terrible place." And I just wonder how. Uh, a person with such a underdeveloped thoughts can desire to live in another country that has more developed thoughts. So that just doesn't make sense. Would you like to address this? <laughs> <laughs> I think this has to do with that, like the complex <coughs> feels like we have inferiority sometimes, yeah. and then they feel like they find it uh, amazing when they go to Europe and they see the welfare state Doesn't working. Work. Yeah, yeah. But, but and when you have uh, attempts to try the minimum of the state uh, social policy in Brazil, they complain about it, it and we say that yeah. Yeah. that's concerned. It uh, yeah, is amazing so, after all, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I would like uh, one more uh, uh, question. Uh, uh, Sylvia asked, uh, uh, well, addressed to Leonardo uh, and all of you, of course, but especially about Brazilian situation. Uh, how do you feel about the, uh, the synonym that uh, human rights became as, uh, in, like in popular, from popular perspective, as a criminal rights. 
So uh, uh, I, right I should criminal. rephrase. Yeah. Yeah. Rights yeah. of criminals. Yeah. Rights of criminals. Yeah. Yeah. Bandido, né? yeah. Bandido que tem If someone yeah. could rephrase yeah. the, the yeah. phrase, please. Mm -hmm. uh, Rights for white humans. Yeah, uh, yeah because there is, there is like in England, yeah, exactly. like groups that's a yeah. kind of uh, yeah. it's viral because uh, yeah, there was a there are some protests against uh, against human rights. And the, the main point, the main argument of the, the ones that are against, uh, as I could say, uh, is that, that this is just, uh, well, for defending criminals. That's it. Um, uh, would you like to address this? Would you like to address this, Leonardo? I mean, I, 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 I mean, I've thought about this before in the context of Brazil, and I think it was, you know, this, this sort of, you know, this distinction of the good and the bad. I mean, I don't, I don't know, I don't really know what your question is about that, or what Sylvia's question oh, it is, just, but uh, what we think about it, or... Uh, well, uh, she mentioned that, uh, well, in, in this context, uh, of, like, having people against human rights, sure, which is far yeah. more insane than it, it sounds, uh, but then, uh, for like, there is this uh, discussion, this right wing discussion yeah. that tries to transform, to bias uh, the, uh, the 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 all the whole discussion about human rights. As, uh, as <laughs> no, no, I, I understand that, but I just don't understand what the, the question about it is because I mean, I think there's a very, you know, it's like, you know, if somebody gets killed, were they good or they bad? And if they were bad, that's it. You know, good criminal to dead criminal. You know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So uh, nice but yeah, that, it's Make more like a like, topic to discuss. Yeah. Like, to how how uh, yeah. would you uh, like? How do you think it should be addressed? How this topic should should be addressed in common belief? <laughs> Try to uh, like how we could yeah. work. May, on. may I give just a pitaco? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's just a, yeah. yeah. It's about. Sorry. I, I think that we have to contextualize. But I think that our main. Uh, uh, task is to think. So we have to think about what happened. And to listen is a main goal, right? And to think. Think what, what happened, what does it mean? We all remember, or people of my generation remember why this started. It started with Brizola uh, defending human rights as the governor of uh, uh, Rio de Janeiro, and then the opposition, in doing opposition to him, who carried with him the, the redness of the left because he had been in exile in 64. Remember, he went, was sent to, uh, uh, no, you don't remember. Oh, I don't remember. I remember from my, I don't remember either. And uh, uh, anyway, uh, that was one level, Foucault is so cool, uh, one level building, uh, Registros de Verdade, you know, system of truth. And this uh, was a, a way of going against Brizola. You didn't really need this because Brizola was never a good administrator, but he was a good politician anyway. By saying, nowadays, human rights means uh, the rights of criminals. So we are all unprotected. And this is spread because it's not only the internet that makes things spread. Things are spread. There are classical studies of gossips in the Middle Ages, in the you know, isolated communities. Who had not read Occasions Verdes, the cheese and the world? How to translate this King's word? Anyway, uh, it's the Middle Age. We, we cannot also. We cannot fantasize that we are, we are the world. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so I think it's this, it's to contextualize, to understand, and to try our best. What does the, somebody ask uh, how to solve the problem? Well, you know, listening, identifying, thinking, and testing, and nobody has recipe. But there will be always people who think differently to what we think. And so, so what is truth? Well, for Bolsonaro, everything I say is lying. It's uh, aber 
salvation. But I cannot eliminate Kosovo. <laughs> because Nazis <laughs> wanted to, uh, totalitarianism, uh, hatred wants to eliminate. And we, if we are thinking critically about hatred, <coughs> it's more difficult. It's not going to the store in the US and use the constitutional right of getting a gun or bury a weapon and kill. See, it's much more difficult and much more impossible and much more horizon. And you are going to, I'm sorry, I'm going to finish, but I will disagree that there is no uh, people, we are not in a war in Brazil. I think that what people in the periphery of the cities in Brazil, which live today, <coughs> now, is a war. Yes. And uh, it's uh, in my view, which is not Bolsonaro's view, but I share with you here, we are a very profoundly hierarchical society and whose core values are of a society based in slavery. Yeah. Period. And what we are seeing among in our own families yeah. is this the return of the repressive. You can call me bleach or well, doesn't matter. It doesn't it doesn't matter. It's something that some voices that were silenced circumstantially, as uh, uh, Leonardo pointed out so well, and now they emerge and they are vociferating. Threatening him, threatening uh, what's her name? Um, Silvia Mega, all the Leonardo's and Silvia Mega's and all that. But we have to be careful not to threaten them. Yeah. So we'll be equal to them. I'm so sorry. I, uh, the only mistake the organizers made <laughs> was <laughs> to invite me to church. <laughs> <laughs> that was a huge. <laughs> but we should learn from mistakes. So we will make this mistake over and over again. Yeah. 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 And then, final question, and then we are going to go to the club, right? Yeah. All right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Not a question. It's more of a comment from what you were saying, with because we most of us agree, but we think about this and like the, I can't pronounce his name, but I, I it was Yeah. Was Nora, how he thinks, and he relates to what Gary said about power and. For me, it seems very much as you're always going to have gossip. You had gossip in World War One and Two about um, just justifying your own why you want to go into war. But here, it's about normally politicians or businessmen who are lobbying politicians, who then wants to maintain their power, and by doing so, they're yeah. always finding ways. It could be fake profiles, or it could be direct. Uh, interaction with social media to you know just just from the at the other side just to throw away the um, spotlight on something which they don't want to be in the spotlight for and they maintain their power by suppressing I guess the truth mm -hmm. yeah. by using their muscles which is all pretty much almost financial but it can also be other things like China cutting off water supply to Tibet we you know this what of kind of resources are valuable which is a different thing but in the end it goes back to power and that relation between even if it's us and them but normally it's the one two percent and the rest and as this is um so we have social inequality and economic inequality in the world brazil especially gender inequality yeah, yeah. this causes people um gives people a lot of angry emotions because they feel it's unjust and it's immoral and it's very easy to take any angry emotion everyone knows that if you wake up on the wrong foot one morning and someone does something petty you will sometimes just get on fire for something very small because you had this emotion already mm -hmm. and i think this is a lot of what you see with the polarization where you people are expressing this um, emotion and very quickly like in Sakamoto and other people, when they express a different view from themselves, it's very easy to turn this into something much, much worse, and you end up with this spiral. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
So this conversation, thank you very much, Juanita, and everybody who is, uh, is here, and uh, you, Leonardo. And this conversation will continue in two ways. First, we are going to go to the pub. I'm so sorry uh -huh. for you, Leonardo. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Drink one for me. Yeah. Toast, yeah. toast to Leonardo. I give it fine, please. Okay. <laughs> and the Sing second, with me. <laughs> second, the second thing is that I would like to make a suggestion to in the YouTube. There is what, in my opinion, is a very good exposition at Café Philosophical of uh, uh, Leandro Carnal about hatred in Brazil. I think uh, we can talk to him too in our I Emmy. Mean, it, it has to do with this conversation of ours, and it's a very good one. Okay, so it's a way to continue. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Uh, about uh, gender equality. Talking about something that we were just talking, we're going to have a, a general meeting, click the opportunity of this.